Uh, thank you, and thank you first of all for inviting me, and thank you for this select group for being here. So, um, I'm going to talk about the temporomandibular joint, or the jaw joint, and uh, about reconstruction of that, and why we, we reconstruct it. So the, the aim is to talk about a little bit about the aims and principles, the various methods, because there's a whole host of methods that have been described over the years. Uh, in particular, whether you use a, an autologous or an aloplastic technique. Um, I'm going to talk about children in specifically, because uh, they uh, pose very specific problems. And then talk a little bit about what's happening uh, up to date and horizon setting perhaps. So the goals of, uh, you could say, any surgery is to restore function and form, reduce disability, stop disease, important to try and prevent having to do repeat surgery, and this is a real issue for us when we operate on children. Um, and again, another issue with children is, of course, they're a moving target. So children grow, and any reconstruction you may do is going to potentially have an impact on that, and will that grow with the child? So th there are a few challenges. Um, but patients don't, what do patients actually come in? Well, they come into t in two forms into my clinics, generally speaking. They either come in in a bit of a crisis, so they may actually have uh, difficulties right from an airway point of view. And we all know that A stands for airway and comes before anything else. Um, so they, they may have issues with breathing, swallowing, and obviously eating. And these are usually children, so growth is affected as well. The adult population are more likely to turn up due to appearance and pain uh, and gradual restriction of mouth opening. So crisis patients are either very young or have developed end-stage joint disease and are much older. So they're at the, they tend to be at the extremes. Uh, and degenerative joint disease, which is often uh, an indication for joint reconstruction as well, tend to be non-crisis patients in the middle. And I'm not going to talk too much about that today. What about the problems of providing a TMJ reconstruction service? Well, for any joint, but particularly to my mind, the TMJ, it can be a very wide degree of diseases that can affect that joint, and they don't all have the same solution. Being a tertiary and actually a quaternary referral service, if you like, um, we have a lot of patients, unfortunately, who arrive on our door having had numerous surgeries previously, and this has a huge impact on our outcomes. If they've had, uh, the record is 24 previous open surgeries on a joint, uh, my chances of therefore getting a, a useful outcome on that patient are greatly diminished before I've even gone anywhere near the patient. And this is because there's complete muscle compromise, neural damage, facial nerve injury already. Uh, and so the outcome for that patient is going to be compromised. And this is a big problem. And we're on a, a, a national and international education method saying, don't touch these patients, send them somewhere. Um, there's growth, as I've talked about. And of course, we're all finding in surgery that patient expectations are just shooting up through the roof. What about the service? Well, it's, if there's not many patients presenting with these disease, it's hard to get experience. And so this is another reason for centralization of services. Um, and you've got to have a, 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 an institution that's going to support the facilities you require. And TM joint reconstruction, especially aloplastic reconstruction, is an expensive business. Um, and in terms of globally, it's just not affordable uh, to many third world countries where joint reconstruction is actually more, much more of an issue than in the Western world. I'm now going to just run through the various techniques. And there's lots of techniques. So I'm try, I'll try not to bamboozle you with a, load of, uh, a lot of jargon. Um, but a lot of patients will just present with fusion of the jaw joint or ankylosis, and they can't open. And so the simplest techniques is simply removing that fusion. And, and leaving a gap or placing a material in there, an interpositional material, with the hope of preventing refusion. You can then step that uh, uh, reconstruction process up, so you can use vascularized free flap reconstruction, just like for cancer patients, non-free grafts, distraction, um, and local measures. And there are quite a, a few steps in bioengineering of producing uh, 
scaffolded condyles of the mandible, uh, but we're a long way off from those being practical solutions uh, to reconstruction. Lots of tissues have been used uh, as an as a interpositional material in a joint, uh, ranging from cartilage to skin graft. The, the most reliable, if you're going to use this technique, is probably abdominal dermis fat graft, and I won't go into all the reasons, but all of these uh, have been used in the past. And the advantage of using an interpositional material, it's a very quick procedure relatively, and it's cheap. And so in India, where ankylosis and fusion of the jaw joint is a huge problem uh, due to trauma and, and middle ear disease, this is their technique. They don't have an option really because of the affordability of their healthcare service. What is the problem? Well, the problem with this is that you can see that if you remove part of a jaw joint on one side, you're going to shorten the jaw joint and you're going to get a lopsided appearance. That in itself isn't the end of the world, but you will therefore get a change in the bite uh, and you will get deviation of the jaw. Now, many patients will adapt, but some won't, and therefore they have chewing difficulties and they can get pain. But the biggest problem is that that gap seems to fill in with bone again. So re-ankylosis is a real issue. That said, this is a girl I treat, treated as a senior registrar, so that's some time ago. Um, and uh, you can see she was only 12 at the time. We did a simple interpositional arthroplasty. Uh, and you can see she's deviated. Her mouth only, however, has remained. Uh, you can see the effect of growth. She has a retruded jaw. It hasn't grown properly. She won't let me go near her again. She's very happy. She doesn't want another operation. So. You can go right to the other extreme. And so if you're going to resect a large portion of the condyle of the TMJ, you're going to reconstruct it. You can reconstruct it with a free flap tissue transfer. And there are some great advantages of that in certain patients. Uh, we have published the biggest series of toe free grafts to the jaw joint. Uh, it's only eight patients. Okay. Why wouldn't you do this very often? Because you need a good indication to do this to a patient. Okay. It's a very successful method of reconstruction. Um, okay. The commonest free graft you see to the jaw joint is actually a fibula, and this is done by our cancer colleagues pretty routinely. And of course, we're talking about a slightly different disease process here. If you have a, a squamous cell carcinoma where you're having to resect the mandible uh, and you're having to resect soft tissue, then a free flap tissue reconstruction is done routinely. Okay. And there are various methods of trying to recreate that jaw. These don't load very well. In cancer patients, you may get away with it because unfortunately you're resecting a lot of their muscle and their, and their loading strength is going to be poor anyway. But in a, in, a, in a normal patient where you haven't done that, these will fracture under the, uh, under the bearing loads that they may have to uh, put up with. So vascular grafts are available. Uh, donor site morbidity is obviously present um, and it can be quite difficult to position these correctly. But for patients who are going to have radiation or where there's been multiple surgery, where there's a poor tissue bed, then um, vascularized grafts may be a way forward. And certainly if you need to reconstruct soft tissue deficits as well, then vascularized grafts are a way forward. Much more commonly, non-vascularized grafts have been used to reconstruct uh, the, the TMJ. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but the, the two that I will mention, the sternoclavicular joint, um, it's been chosen because embryologically and biologically it's very similar to the mandibular condyle. It's the only other joint with fibrocartilage and its articulating service. Um, you split the clavicle um, and uh, Wolford pre presented a big series. It doesn't do very well in rheumatoid arthritis and uh, arthropathies, presumably because it can be affected by the systemic inflammation. Um, and it doesn't do very well, and no autogenous reconstruction does very well if there's been a previous failed reconstruction. Uh, you can get clavicle fractures, and a third of the patients in his series had a clavicle fracture post-op. Um, and of course, if you fall the wrong side of the clavicle, you're into some quite tiger country. Uh, so there is a potential for high morbidity. Okay. The much more common reconstruction for the, the TMJ, and still the workhorse internationally. So the vast majority of patients who need a reconstruction of the TMJ in the world, be that in the Nile Delta or in India, are going to end up with an interpositional graft or a rib graft. And that's based on cost and availability as much as anything else. Um, so 
we published a big series of costochondral graphs many years ago. It, the cartilage component of the costochondral graft, of course, allows growth, and so it's an ideal choice for children, uh, or has been for many years. Uh, and it can work well where there's been no previous surgery and where there's uh, congenital disease, but it can also fail quite spectacularly. Again, it can't cope with the loading very well. But the real problem with a rib graft is you just don't know how it's going to behave. So you place the rib graft and it can grow or it might just shri shrivel away and resorb or it might overgrow. And so it's got a very variable biological behavior. So this is a girl with congenital disease. I placed a rib graft when she was young, uh, very happy with it. Um, and you can see in the radiograph uh, on the lower right that it's gradually resorbing away and she's going to need a, a reconstruction again in due course. This is the complete opposite, a rib graft that has completely overgrown uh, and caused a deviation of the jaw, uh, a malocclusion. I'd much rather have this situation because you can obviously correct it, okay? And it's, much, uh, and it's easier to correct an overgrowth than it is uh, an undergrowth, if you like. This is the worst case scenario for a rib graft. It just completely fuses up to the skull base and then you're left with a jaw which doesn't move at all. Okay. Um, and so this is the problem with the rib grafts, uh, but they're still potentially uh, the major reconstruction method around the world. And it is important because you can get a bit pessimistic and uh, when you're doing rib grafts all the time, they can work. So this was a chap who had uh, completely destroyed his condyle from trauma and had a rib graft reconstruction. I wouldn't do a rib graft on him now. I put a prosthetic joint in and I'll talk about that. And this is a child who uh, also had an ankylosis uh, treated with a rib graft. So it, they can work. Distraction is well known to our orthopedic colleagues in terms of uh, gradually expanding the bone. You can distract the jaw as well. Obviously everything's much more miniaturized. Um, and um, there's, there's a lot in the literature about the various what is distraction, what isn't distraction. So you need to be very careful about it. And we've done this again in children where you're just trying to perhaps in this girl do a crisis intervention, get her breathing. She was, uh, uh, and, and this chap who, uh, they were both heading for tracheostomies. Um, so the aim here is not really to release the jaw, is to lengthen the jaw and get an airway and then can worry about the reconstruction a bit later on. Okay. So you can, of course, actually do distraction to produce a new condyle as well, which is a slightly different technique uh, and one which I haven't uh, much experience of. I'm going very fast because I don't want to, I want you to get the principles rather than worry too much about the, humor, uh, the, the huge number of different techniques that are available. But, but this has really revolutionized uh, our current uh, uh, working. And just like any other joint in the body, you can produce a prosthesis as well. So, and just like any other joint in the body, be that a hip or a knee, uh, the success of an aloplastic joint reconstruction is gonna depend on stability. It's going to depend on biocompatibility. It's got to be the appropriate design. And of course, that's going to vary depending on which joint it is. So the TMJ is not a load-bearing joint, but when it's in function, it produces huge loads. Okay, and so this is completely different to a hip. Okay, and probably the nearest uh, major joint to it is a knee, uh, which you wouldn't necessarily expect. Uh, and of course, you've always got to have the correct indication. And we've got it wrong. So, so aloplastic joint reconstruction for the TMJ has, has, is not a new concept, okay? So on the left-hand side, the initial materials used in were proplast and Teflon, and these completely fragmented, okay, and caused uh, uh, foreign body reactions and, and erosion. And, and these were completely banned and all withdrawn. Every patient who'd had these placed in the States and in the UK had to be recalled to have the joints removed because they were presenting with perforated skull bases. Um, so it's been spectacularly uh, wrong. And, and we've also had our problems with metal on metal uh, designs in the past, just like uh, we we're reading about in the British Medical Journal. And so on the lower right is, that's, that I haven't even got to the joint yet, and there's the metallosis that you're seeing in the soft tissue overlying the joint. So for many years uh, after this, 
aloplastic TM joint reconstruction was basically off the table because of the disasters, nobody would look at it. And it was really related to poor design. So it's back, it's been back for a little while, uh, and there's a number of indications. Uh, it, it does fantastically well in the inflammatory arthritis. Um, ankylosis we've talked about, previous failed reconstruction. And there are some contraindications, or certainly relative contraindications. All joints wear. If you're going to put a TM joint reconstruction in a patient, you're going to have to think about how long is it going to last. So age can be a relative contraindication, or the patient needs to be aware that they are going to require revision surgery. Okay. Um, clearly allergy to the metals and, the, and there's a, a, a great deal of controversy about patch testing and how can you see if patients are allergic or not. And that active disease is a contraindication to any um, aloplastic joint reconstruction. So what are the systems we use now? Well, there's two systems which are exactly identical in their materials and their testing. And they're basically an ultra high molecular uh, polyethylene fossa, which is like a cup, okay, uh, and um, a to predominantly titanium metal condyle. And the vast majority, every TN joint replacement I've done has been a custom bespoke joint, okay? So in the states where these both are designed, um, interestingly, the FDA will only approve uh, Biomet, who are, 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 who are the current joint I use to have stock joints in the States because that's what they presented at their FDA. So it's different, but the cost is approximately the same. So it doesn't make any sense to me to use a stock joint, which you're trying to fit to a patient, make the patient fit to when you can use a custom joint, which is much easier and, and it's going to fit. And the surgery can be done in one or two stages with experience. Um, initially, your, the, the advice is that you resect the joint you do a CT scan, they make a stereolithographic model, they make a custom joint, you take the surgery back, the patient back to theatre and you place the joint. Very simple, but of course you've got to open the joint twice, you've got to risk injuring the facial nerve twice. So if you can do everything in one stage um, by predicting the resection and planning, that's much better. So unless it's very complex now, I've reached the stage where virtually all my surgery is single stage. Okay. So, there's lots of uh, different protocols. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about allergy. Um, so the vast majority of the joint is titanium, okay, which is very biocompatible. Um, but there is nickel and cobalt and molybdenum, and these are in the condylar head to try and harden the joint so that they wear, uh, don't wear so quickly. So patients can be sent, uh, allergic to these, particularly nickel. Um, and there is no reliable test. Patch testing is not reliable. Um, so there's a, bit, a lot of pay, uh, my colleagues do do patch testing. I don't. I just say, have you got any problem with cheap jewellery? I often get the response, I don't wear cheap jewellery. Um, but if they do, I make a pure titanium joint. Okay? And if they don't, uh, we discuss whether they want patch testing or whether they want me just to go ahead. I haven't had to remove a single joint with that protocol due to allergy. Okay, so... What are the outcomes? Well, this, this is uh, interesting. This was, uh, Mercury wrote this some while ago. Um, it was a, and the outcomes were based on patients who initially were going for TM joint reconstruction, who had often had multiple surgeries before. So it was regarded as a very much an end stage surgery. So you'd have two or three attempts at a reconstruction, it all failed, you have a joint, okay? We've gone completely the other way around now, okay? We know that the success of a joint replacement is greatly influenced by previous interventions. So actually, don't do the previous interventions. Do a joint replacement. Okay. So these success rates were on multiply operated patients, and I would suggest that we, we would now report much better outcomes. And Lou Mercury this year has um, presented 20-year follow-up of this joint. And most of those joints, over 90% uh, are still in the patients going well. And this is very helpful when I see a patient because when they ask me how long will this joint last, the answer is I don't know. Okay, but we're getting up to 20 year follow up in some patients. Okay, so what do you do? Do you use an autogenous reconstruction or an aloplastic reconstruction? 
Well, the advantages of using the patient's own tissue is it's obviously biological. Uh, it's relatively easy to adapt. Um, there is potentially growth. And the disadvantages that I've alluded to already, um, loading and fracture, the donor site, which actually, um, if this is a regular procedure you do, you're going to have a, a very low donor site morbidity. Um, the variable growth is a big problem. Um, and another big problem is the previously scarred patient. Um, capillaries uh, have to integrate into, into vascularized tissue, uh, into non-vascularized free grafts. Um, and they find it difficult if there's scar tissue in the way. Okay. So um, vascularized grafts, fine. They're more complex, but non-vascularized grafts, the vascular ingrowth is a, can be a real issue. Aloplastic reconstruction, well, certainly they can reproduce the anatomy, but they are a mechanical fix, not a bio, a bio uh, not a true biological fix. There's no donor, donor site. They've certainly reduced operating time, um, and they certainly reduce ankylosis. But they wear. You can still get dystrophic bones. So you can still get re-ankylosis around the prosthetic joint. They don't grow, okay, um, and they cost bilateral TM joint replacement at the present time is $20,000, okay? So every patient I put in has to have an individual funding request, uh, and I'll talk about that later. That is prohibitive to the third world, okay, completely, okay? So the only joints I've placed in third world countries have been charity cases where the company have donated the joints, okay? So we, we actually, uh, public, there's very few trials uh, or publications looking at the contrast. We did a big two-center trial when I was in New Orleans looking at their cost grafts, comparing them with um, uh, grafts we placed in, in Oxford, Cheltenham and Gloucester, um, four-year follow-up. And what we found is both groups did well because they were not, not good candidates in the first place, so their mouth opening improved. Complications were pretty similar, but interestingly, the further surgery rate was significantly higher in the autogenous group. They went back to theatre again within that four-year period. Uh, a more recent study, very small, but done in Australia by Dimitrulis, showed, showed just resecting the joint versus a rib graft versus prosthesis. Interestingly, just resecting the joint often would give the best range of motion. And, um, his follow-up was only two years, so we'll be interested to see how that goes. The ribs have the most complications, and the prosthesis gave the best quality of life outcomes. And of course, all of our data now is based on patient reported outcomes, um, which I'll talk about again. So what do you do? Well, it depends upon the disease, depends upon whether you're resecting a malignant disease, whether you're gonna to have to do a primary reconstruction, the patient may go for radiotherapy, depends on whether you're gonna do, um, how old the patient is. So we've, we've uh, we summarized the indications for TM joint reconstruction. In Oxford, we presented uh, to our European colleagues that everybody should just be put into three big broad categories. I like simplicity. Uh, they've either got a mu mutilated anatomy, in which case you should probably be doing a prosthetic joint most of the time. They're a growth abnormality, in which case you should probably be doing an autogenous reconstruction. Or they're a failed reconstruction, in which case you should probably be doing aloplastic. Okay, so let's just look at some examples. So this chat was that referred to me by my rheumatology colleagues with uh, um, his complaint was dribbling, okay? But actually, what I, um, he'd, he'd collapsed, his condyles had resorbed away completely. Um, and so one of the consequences of that is that your mandible slips back. And so I actually asked him, I said, well, do you snore at night? Okay. Um, because the problem for these patients that sometimes isn't recognized is that they have restricted airways, okay, as the mandible drops back. And so um, he, he had a bilateral joint replacement and we planned to advance his mandible using the joints and reconstruct his joint, get his mouth opening and eating better. Uh, and this is just showing him, I haven't got some pre-ops, I'm afraid, just showing that his facial nerve is working. And you can, and you can see that we've uh, advanced him in the, in the mandible. But in inflammatory arthropathies, I don't get enough patients referred to me early enough. I keep uh, talking to my rheumatologist because aloplastic joints can revolutionize their eating and breathing. Mm. This is a patient, condyles have completely disappeared, okay, uh, from idiopathic resorption, which is a, 
it affects females, there's certainly a hormonal element. So she had a normal jaw at birth, it grew, and then it suddenly, her jaw joints started melting away. And you can see the impact on her lower jaw. And so she came in complaining about her appearance, okay? But actually, look how narrow that airway is in her. If I can get the mouse on it. Okay, so she's got a real airway issue that she hadn't really picked up on, but she was sleepy in the day. She has sleep apnea, okay? So not only were we able to uh, correct her appearance, but look at the difference in the airway after we've advanced that mandible, okay? Um, and, and in fact, the discrepancy at the tooth level was, was not as much as was required at the, the jaw level, so we've had to do other procedures as well. So you can make a huge impact, and patients come for different reasons, and, and actually, when you examine these patients more and more, you find that they really have breathing difficulties that they haven't picked up on. Mutilated anatomy, aloplastic joints. Clearly, if you've got a growth abnormality, uh, and this was a chondrosarcoma of the glenoid fossa, uh, you're, you haven't, once that's diagnosed, you need to resect that. You haven't got five weeks, it takes about five weeks to make an aloplastic joint. Well, we're not going to leave a chondrosarcoma of the skull base five weeks while you make a joint, um, so you need to resect it. Uh, and, and in these patients, I go for the most simplistic reconstruction I can, partly because I want to know they're going to still be alive in two years' time. If they're still alive in two years' time and they're not functioning well, then we'll consider an aloplastic reconstruction if they want one. This CT scan on the right is three years post-op. Um, so he's just got a calvarial bone graft reconstructing his skull base and a simple shunting up of his posterior mandible. He's absolutely happy. He doesn't want me to do anything else. Okay, um, And so that's fine. Uh, if you've got uh, a benign mass, uh, so this was actually pseudo-gout, uh, perforating, so a biopsy, perforating, about to perforate the skull base, then you can do a planned resection, okay? Uh, and so w we planned his resection, we planned to make a joint, uh, and that will give him a better re restoration of occlusion with no swing, no deviation, okay? Um, so... In growth abnormalities, if it's a benign disease, you have got the opportunity to do uh, a planned uh, aloplastic reconstruction. And the third group of patients is patients who've had a failed reconstruction. So this was a young lady who unfortunately had, a, had to have a mandible resected for her tumour, uh, and she'd had a fibular graft placed at the time of primary reconstruction, which had failed completely. Um, so she had another fibula placed, which also failed completely. Turned out she had a coagulopathy uh, um, when they examined her, and this is part of the reason that her, her venous um, anastomosis kept failing. Uh, but actually, we put, a, we put a, a modified TM joint replacement in, and she's done very well from that. Uh, and, and this is a, a chap I treated recently who'd had an aloplastic joint made in Poland, wrong materials, there's no fossa, okay? I think they'd made it in the laboratory there. Um, and, you know, it's easy to be critical, but they didn't really necessarily have an option, okay? This, he'd had mastoiditis and three previous uh, resections for ankylosis. This is how he came to me. And what I want to point out to you again is, you can, this is a huge mass of ankylosis. This doesn't move, but look at this airway. Okay, and his, his jaw is retruded backwards. Uh, this was the ankylosis. This is the, this is the ankylosis post-resection. This is a two-stage procedure. Uh, I think it's too difficult to try and plan your resection on a model and then reproduce that plan in the theatre. Uh, so he came back and uh, has had a osteotomies to bring him forward. But look at the difference in this airway now. So his wife is delighted. She says she's never slept so well. Um, okay. um, and this is another failed reconstruction. This was the girl I showed you earlier had had rib grafts that had fused. And so as an adult, I've placed bilateral joint replacements and she's had some Coleman fat grafting to, to improve the soft tissue profile. This is congenital disease um, initially. So in adults, tending towards aloplastic, uh, except in a hostile environment, or where there's a large tissue deficit, 
where I think my days of doing free bone grafts are numbered. I think if you can't do it with an aloplastic graft, I think we should be doing free f tissue transfer. Okay. Um, what about children? Well, they are the most frustrating uh, things, as we all know, and they are the most frustrating things if they have ankylosis. Um, it affects airway, it affects speech, it affects their eating ability, uh, it affects their ability to look after their teeth, which they don't like doing it anyway, um, and of course it affects their growth. And the, and the worst thing about these patients is you can actually potentially do them well, but then they've got to cooperate and look after their reconstruction, which, which they don't like to do. Uh, and so this is a, a young chap with ankylosis from trauma, which is unusual in the Western uh, Hemisphere. Um, and you can see he's got an ankylosis, his jaw is deviated, he doesn't open his mouth, his jaw isn't grown. Okay? He's got a breathing problem. His mum didn't bring him in because he had a breathing problem. His mum brought him in because he couldn't clean his teeth and he couldn't open his mouth. Okay. So how do we treat those? Well, this is the classical, this is him actually, having, uh, uh, a, you can see the ankylosis here, complete fusion, there's no jaw joint. Um, this is after resection, there's a gap. And this is me putting some uh, a muscle flap over to try and prevent bone to bone contact and then putting a rib graft in. Um, the trouble is, I don't know how that's gonna behave, uh, and I can tell you, this isn't the same patient, this is another rib graft. I can tell you, this is a rib graft I placed in, uh, uh, in, a, in a girl when she was seven, and this is her a few years later. Completely refused. Okay. Um, so it's a very frustrating condition. Um, this is going back to distraction again, and this is a young boy with neonatal sepsemia, complete ankylosis of the uh, jaw joint. Tracheostomy, he, was a, he had to have a tracheostomy because he couldn't breathe, okay? And so here we just stretched the jaw in order to get the tracheostomy out, which was successful, and later he'll have a reconstruction of his jaw joint, okay? What age do you reconstruct the jaw joint in a child? Because joints need to move. If this joint doesn't move, Okay, speech can be affected, mastication can be affected, but also the muscles start to atrophy. So when you do reconstruct that joint, they won't have anything to move it. Okay. If you reconstruct it too early, then the reconstruction fails due to lack of cooperation. If you reconstruct it too late, then you may have lost some of the capacity for that joint to work. It's a very difficult problem. Okay. Uh, and it can get more complex than this chap where there's a soft tissue deficit, uh, we will go for a vascularized graft. So in children, it's, it's, diff it's difficult. If they have potential for normal growth, and this is something about the, the mandible grows due to muscles acting on the bones. It's not a, a growth center in the jaw joint alone. Um, so if you can restore that in somebody with perhaps ankylosis after a trauma, where they have normal muscles and soft tissue, then you should perhaps do reconstruction early and try and get that joint moving. In a patient where they have congenital disease and the muscles and the soft tissue are also deficient, then actually reconstructing that joint early might not make any difference because they still haven't got anything necessary to move it. And so you may be worth uh, waiting till they're older. And Mercury, they play, uh, a patient who'd had several operations, had a jaw joint, aloplastic joint replaced from ankylosis um, at the age of seven. They, they reported that patient in 2009 at the age of 18 with normal growth. And that patient, they'd restored the jaw joint and the functional matrix had grown the jaw. Okay, so the, so the question now is, and this is coming and I have no doubt I, have, I will be placing aloplastic joints in children soon because it's still better and maybe better to replace that joint as they grow than keep doing repeated surgeries that fail anyway. What about advances? Well, virtual surgical planning has made my life so much easier. Okay. So in the old days, I would have models going across the pond uh, and determining, doing resections on them going back. Now at seven o'clock every Wednesday, I sit at my computer in my office and I have a web meeting with the states where we design next week's 
or a joint for five weeks time. We design it together with an engineer, all on the computer, all virtually. We sign it off, five weeks later it arrives. It's fantastic, okay? But more than that, this is a patient who's planned for 23rd of December. Uh, why she's happy to have surgery that day, I have no idea, but she is. So she's had bilateral rib grafts due to neonatal septicemia when she was young. I've reconstructed the, the left side. Uh, this is flipped, actually, so you're looking at her. I've reconstructed her right side. You're looking at her left side. It's been flipped. Um, and I didn't go anywhere near this rib, which was placed at GOS, and has done, done very well because it's actually articulating with the uh, foramen lacerum not the TMJ, um, but my uh, vascular colleagues have told me it has to come out because she's getting symptoms of erosion. So we're just waiting for this to erode through the carotid and kill her. So now I have no choice but to go and remove that rib graft, okay? Um, and we've decided, and, and this is virtual, this is the beauty of virtual planning, we're going to put joints on both sides. Uh, we're gonna bring her forward so I can plan this and I can make a wafer, but I can also plan to move her upper jaw. I can do this all on the computer with wafers and then everything just turns up. Okay. So virtual planning. The next thing is to have our own 3D printer. Okay. And then actually all they have to send me is the disc and we can print it in the hospital. And I'm sure that will come. Um, so this is where virtual planning really can be uh, helpful. So this is a young girl with Treach Collins sent from elsewhere to me for reconstruction of her jaw joint to try and get her tracheostomy out. She's four. How do you reconstruct that? Okay. She has nothing for you to use. Okay. She could use rib grafts. I wouldn't be able to, I don't think I could advance us far enough with the rib grafts to get the tracheostomy out. You could use aloplastic joints. Do I want to put aloplastic joints into a four year old girl? Well, it's not totally unreasonable if it gets rid of her tracheostomy and she grows for a while, okay? Um, but with virtual planning, we try to work out a way of distracting the small amount of bone there. And this is where it can come into its own. We've worked out a vector. We've worked out that we can stretch her. We have to stretch that bone over three centimeters because she has no posterior mandible. It's going to go backwards before it goes forwards. So we're gonna to have to distract her let the posterior segment hit the skull base, and then she'll start being pushed forwards. And we can just about get a distractor on there. We can get a model and pre-bend it. We can superimpose where all the teeth and the ID nerve running in her jaw is and try and avoid those structures. Um, and this is what she will end up like, and I hope that will um, decannulate her. And I'll be able to tell you because I'm doing it in two weeks' time. Um, okay, so... You can see the, the vast problems, but the vast benefit you can get from reconstructing these people. So what's been going on about, the, the, these are potentially rare disease. If you look at the figures for uh, 2012, less than 250 TM joint reconstructions were done. How do I know that? Because seven or eight years ago, uh, we set up the British Association of Temporal Mandibular Surgeons, uh, and we decided that we had to limit this surgery to get experience. Um, and we decided we ought to have a national database. So every single one surgeon doing that has meant to put their data into a national database that we, so we pre, if you like, emptied surgeon reporting data. Um, we now presented all that to NICE, and NICE have now approved TM joint reconstruction fully Okay, because we've provided them with the evidence ourselves, okay, as long as it's done in a centre which is being audited by a surgeon with experience. So now we're talking to the commissioners and NHS England because it is a right nuisance filling in an individual funding request for every patient I want to do a TM joint reconstruction on. Um, and so I suspect there will be six TN joint reconstruction centres in the United Kingdom, be, not before long, commissioned from NHS England. And Oxford needs to be one of them. Okay? So currently my catchment area is South East England. Okay? So Isle of Wight, Portsmouth, Gloucester, all those counties, London is coming this way. 
and, and that has consequences for me, but also for the trust. Uh, and we need to make that a, a dedicated service. So hopefully that's given you a flavor and not bored you too much. I hope it wasn't uh, pitched at too high a level in terms of your, what you might want to get out of it. Is there any questions? <laughs>